We're now talking about the, um, the nature of the manifestation. Uh, and as I started to, uh, to introduce them, a, a real challenge uh, is understanding the, the origin and nature, where does their inspiration come from? Who are these individuals? Um, in, in relation to this model of reality in which the two-story building has collapsed, if, 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 is there another way of thinking about the prophet than in a top-down way? Uh, and let's look at maybe the next slide. I think I have, and the one after, and the one, uh, yeah, sort of the way we usually think about the prophet, Charlton Heston, yeah, <laughs> our paradigm for prophethood. Um, so. Is there another way of looking uh, uh, about uh, look, looking at this reality? And the the Baha'i writings have an enormous amount written about uh, about them and and ways of thinking about about them. Uh, the Bab himself describes himself as as in some way mediating the higher and the lower as a almost as a, as a veil. He says, see say, he whom God shall make manifest is indeed the primal veil of God. Above this veil you can find nothing other than God, while beneath it you can discern all things emanating from God. It's an interesting imagery that this uh, I invites us to. Uh, almost the, the idea of there being, well, this, it, it lines up with the idea of a tree beyond which there's no passing. You know, there's a sort of end point. Beyond that, it's just you know, it's the uncharted desert. Uh, there's, there's nothing to mark one, one place off from another. Uh, that's where the road ends. Uh, but on the other side is, is civilization uh, and, and everything that results from it. Uh, this all things emanating from God beneath the primal veil is also, I in, in another way, a recapitulation of, of the idea expressed in the opening verses of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God, and the word was God, uh, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So this uh, idea of a, of a, a logos, the principle, the, the word in the, in the Gospel of John in Greek is logos. And the logos uh, or, or is, is the same as the primal will in, in the Baha'i writing. So we're talking about the same idea of, of there being a, in some way an origin point of, of, of reality which is located in a strange place because what sense does it make to say that the prophet is the origin point of reality? I mean, don't they come a little bit later than the Big Bang? You know, so how can you say that they create reality? Well, obviously it's not meant in a literal sense. It's meant in some other figurative sense. You know, in, in some way they're the generators of, of human spiritual reality. Okay, in what ways are they the generators of, of human spiritual reality? In what ways is sort of the universe of possibility emanates uh, from these beings. Uh, and, and one way to think of them is, is, in, is in terms of the idea of, uh, the idea of a circle of existence. You know, the, the everything is emanating from God and everything is at the same time returning to God. Um, and everything in existence is located somewhere ar along that, that circle, that, that emanative circle, which is comprised of these two arcs. Uh, and human reality is at some point along that circle. Actually, Abdul Baha locates it right at the bottom, you know, right at the um, right at the sort of the, the midpoint of that circle, the farthest from the origin point in a way. Uh, the, the entirety of the arc of descent lies behind it, and in front of it lies all of the degrees of spiritual progress. One can think of the the let's say the station of the, of the prophet within this metaphor as being the sort of the next stage beyond us along that circle of existence. Certainly human in, in any sort of genetic sense, you would wish, you, 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 if you, at, at some point, people will uh, imagine take some of the hair of Baha or Abdu Baha and, and sequence it. And it's gonna be normal human DNA, of course. But the consciousness that they represent is, um, is, is that sort of next stage. And, and somehow they help pull us up to that next level. Uh, and this is that deep, let's say, deep principle of, uh, in, in the Baha'i writings of, of the idea of education. 
and the importance of education. And in every realm, there's an educator. In every realm, there's something which, um, there's something which advances realities at one degree of existence to the next degree of existence. Uh, something over and above it in some on ontological sense. You know, human reality has a certain potential which is not manifested unless there's an educator for that reality. Um, so let's look at a few more quotations. As, as, the, as this primal veil that Baha'u'llah, that, that the Bab describes, is in some way both associated with the origin but also associated with, with creation, the, the manifestation has symbolically two different, two different aspects. There, there's an aspect in which there's a, an identification with the divine, and there's an aspect uh, in which it is identified with creation. Baha'u'llah says this in many beautiful ways. Uh, a major part of, of the Kitab Gan, or the Book of Certitude, part two of the Book of Certitude, is taken up with this extended description of these two stages, two stations of the manifestation of God. Uh, a, a different passage in Gaining puts it in the following words. Know verily that whenever this youth turneth his eyes towards his own self, he findeth it the most insignificant of all creation. When he contemplates, however, the bright effulgences he hath been empowered to manifest, lo, that self is transfigured before him into a sovereign potency permeating the essence of all things visible and invisible. So, um, Let's look at the next passage. The idea of the prophet as embodying the light or embodying reality uh, is, is beautifully put in the Gospel of Thomas, one of the, um, one of the Gospels uh, that was left out of the canonical uh, Gospels uh, and was found intact, buried in the, in the sands of Egypt uh, in, in the mid 20th century, uh, and it was known only in fragmentary form and translated in its entirety in modern times. And it appears to have been, if anything, an older, even a, even an older, more original generations of the sayings of Jesus Christ than those which are found in um, uh, in the four Gospels that we know. And one of the statements from the Gospel of Thomas: "I am the light which is before all things. It is I who am all things." From me all things came forth, and to me all things extend. Split a piece of wood, and I am there. Lift up the stone, and you will find me. Uh, let's look at the next quote. So more on these twofold stations. Uh, so in the Kitabi Gan, this is where Baha'u'llah gives the most perhaps canonical explanation of it. He says, these manifestations of God have each a twofold station. One is the station of pure abstraction and essential unity. The other station is the station of distinction and pertaineth to the world of creation and to the limitations thereof. I think in a slide or two I'll have, let's see. Actually, yeah, let's go back to that one. Okay, so among the, the different metaphors, Baha'u'llah gives us a series of metaphors for thinking about the nature of the manifestation. In other than this top-down, you know, Moses carrying the, you know, the, the tablets uh, of the Ten Commandments sort of a way. Um, one of the ways um, uh, was here, and I referred to it yesterday as being really a central metaphor for, for Baha'u'llah's own description of his, of his revelation, uh, which takes us in a different kind of pragmatic direction than thinking of, of the prophet as the revealer of, of the totality of eternal truths, which then have to be decoded by us you know, in successive ages. Uh, Baha'u'llah's metaphor for his own job as prophet uh, is, is that of a physician who's delivering a remedy. Uh, and two different places, um, we have examples, and, and there are more, but these are two good examples. 
He says the prophets of God should be regarded as physicians whose task is to foster the well-being of the world and its peoples, that through the spirit of oneness they may heal the sickness of a divided humanity. And the all-knowing physician hath his finger on the pulse of mankind. He perceiveth the disease and prescribeth in his unerring wisdom the remedy. And he goes on to say that the remedy which a previous age requires can never be the same as that which a, a later age required. Uh, and so embedded within this idea of the prophet as deliverer of remedy is the idea of progressive revelation, that you know, it's, it's never going to be exactly the same. And sometimes if the sickness is very different, the remedy can look very different. Uh, but if, if we don't realize that, and if we focus on the components in the remedy, uh, then we can easily mistake them as two unrelated things. But when we realize that the thing that makes it prophecy, the thing, you know, the, the the, the magic in it is the is is the fact that it heals the, the sickness. And another way of saying that it heals the sickness is that it it draws us forward along this path of our spiritual evolution to the next stage. You know, another way of saying it, still another way of saying it, is that it helps advance the human race from the stage of of turbulent adolescence, which we're now passing through, into and ushers us into the next stage in our in our collective evolution, which is the station uh, of our of our collective coming of age. So we have the, the metaphor of the of the physician. Uh, in the next slide, we have another uh, metaphor, the metaphor of the gardener. So Abdu'l-Baha says the teachings of Christ and the prophets are necessary for man's education and guidance. Why? Because they are the divine gardeners who till the earth of human hearts and minds. They educate man, uproot the weeds, burn the thorns, and remodel the waste places into gardens and orchards. You can think of a gardener, actually, as, as an educator in the, in the vegetable kingdom. You know, they educate the plants. Uh, and th just as in the human realm, you know, plant education or cultivation, which is another word for that, uh, is is the art uh, and science uh, of bringing out all of the potentialities which lie within which which lie within the seed, uh, enable the, the fruit to produce all of the fruit of which it is capable of producing. Uh, the the next few slides I think give examples of education. So, what are some other examples? If we could extend the metaphor of education and sort of abstract it, if education takes something which is potential in a certain realm of existence and gives it the actuality. Um, well, there's education in all the realms. You know, education in the mineral realm is the transformation of a coal into a diamond. Uh, that's one way of, uh, of thinking about, you know, there's a potential within, you know, within gross matter to take on this crystalline structure that, that's uh, symmetric and transparent and, and, and beautiful. There's education in the, um, uh, of course, in the, in the, in the vegetable realm. Uh, of, of cultivating the plants. And sometimes the, the cultivation process involves removing branches, uh, doing things which in a short time frame looks like it's causing harm or causing suffering. So one of the, one, one of the wisdoms of, of, of suffering it is, is to see it in relationship to education, that sometimes the suffering that, that is uh, uh, that, that we undergo is part of the process of, uh, of, of advancing our consciousness to the next level. Uh, there's a wonderful talk by, I wish I could remember it, uh, exactly who it was. it was. It was a rabbi, and it was one of these few-minute YouTube videos. Uh, and he's discuss discussing the wisdom of suffering in a way that I hadn't thought of before. And he describes a lobster in its shell, you know, and, and how you know, the lobster continues to grow until it, it's in, until it basically bursts the confines of its shell. Um, and he says, that, you know, it's, it's only through this, this process of, of suffering that it, can, that it can actually grow, you know, regrow a, a new shell. But th the idea of things having to suffer to attain the, the, full, the fullness of their potentiality uh, is, is an idea which exists in, in all uh, the kingdoms of existence. In the animal kingdom, too, you know, the, the training and education uh, of the animal kingdom 
uh, it brings to, to fruition sort of the maximum potentialities which, with which they are endowed. In, in the case of uh, the training of horses, as in, in the case of the, of the training of, of children, uh, we're bringing out potentiality. Now, a thing you might have noticed in all these examples is that the, 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 the manifestation of the potentialities of things uh, is in a relationship to the next level above, right? So the coal doesn't care if it's a coal or a diamond. It's we who care. You know, it's we who value the diamond more than the coal. It, it, it's, the, it's the level above that educates the level of below and brings out potentialities which are of use and benefit to the next, to the next level up. So similarly, you know, the, the spiritual virtues that we, that we cultivate may not seem to be all that much use to sort of get by and earn our, you know, and, and to advance our careers and to sort of, uh, and to, let's say, express the fullness of our material potentialities may not always seem to do that. That's because the, the, the development of our spiritual virtues is in reference to the next level up. Uh, and that's, the, that's the, the position and station of the manifestations. They're like the cultivators in the human world. Uh, and they're pulling us up to that next level in the, uh, in, in the realm of consciousness. So this is put very, very, very nicely in a, a, a pilgrim note um, by Dr. Falshir, who was the, 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 the Holy Family's homeopathic doctor uh, who was on hand uh, to hear many talks about Baba uh, right before he departed for the West, for his Western journeys in, in the years 1990, 1910. Uh, and her, her pilgrim notes actually form a whole volume of fascinating talks, which I hope someday will be, will be available. Um, uh, among these is a talk about the nature of the manifestation, and, and in this talk he says, the holy divine manifestations are unique and peerless. They are the archetypes of celestial and spiritual virtues in their own age and cycle. They stand on the mount of vision, and they foreshadow the perfection of the evolving race. It's a lovely image that brings to my mind about the sort of role and function of the, of the prophet. It's, you know, they're sort of Right, you know, they're above us. They're one step above us on that ladder of uh, of consciousness. Um, another way of thinking about the prophet is as uh, a musician, as, uh, as as a kind of an artist, a painter, or a musician. Uh, and it's a great analogy. It's a deep analogy. Um, it um, the the I don't know if anyone recognizes this particular photo. It's just just out of curiosity. Does anybody recognize where this comes from? There's a few. This is Joshua. This is that famous article. Okay, a few people of you have seen this. Pearls Before Breakfast was a Pulitzer Prize winning article in, I think, the Post, the Washington Post, a few years ago. Uh, and Joshua Bell, who's a, a world famous violin player, is here playing his golden era Stradivarius violin um, in, the, in the Washington subway and uh, busking for, you know, for change. Um, uh, as part of an agreement with uh, the Washington Post that you know, he went there anonymously to play you know, a set of some of his best stuff uh, and, and some of the, you know, the, the, most, the, the most sparkling pieces in the, in the solo you know, violin repertoire, uh, including the Chacon, Chacon of Bach. Um, and so he does this. It's a transcendent piece. Uh, and and, and he, he's playing this in the New York subway. I'm uh, sorry, in the Washington, D.C. subway at, uh, in the, during the morning rush hour, and about 1,000 people are, you know, walk by during this 45-minute set. And, you know, the Post, the, the, the reporter at the Post, you know, wanted, you know, was asking a question, well, how many people will stop and listen to the most exquisite music being played by the most accomplished musician on the most expensive violin, you know, all, the, all, all the superlatives piled up? How many people are going to notice, you know? How many people have the ear to hear, you know, as they catch the snatches of the, of the, you know, the strains of the violin and, and the subways they walk past? You know, it's a bit unfair because it's a noisy environment and it's not, you know, it, it's a bit of an unfair test in that sense because it's not an ideal place to listen to, uh, to the subtleties that, that only Joshua Bell can lend to this, uh, to this piece. But nevertheless, it's, a, it's such a brilliant metaphor to the, to the prophet. And uh, what is the prophet doing? You know, the prophet is, is the musician of the age who's playing the celestial melodies. Uh, but he's playing in the subway. You know, 
he's playing in a place that we don't expect. You know, we thought he was going to come down from the clouds, but instead he's coming from this foreign country, speaking this foreign language, and using you know the imagery and language of a very foreign l religion. Uh, so it's not it's not something to be expected. I mean, it's a, it's a very kind of alien thing. And only those who have the ear to hear could hear it. And even even today, you know, only those who sort of have the ear to catch, you know, the, the majesty and music and, and, and mystery of this, of these words are are, are those who, who recognize. In the case of Joshua Bell, um, of those thousand people, um, I wish I could remember exactly how many. I think it was seven or something. Was it seven? Seven people stopped uh, for any length of time to to, to listen to the music. Um, Right, so it's also unfair a bit because, you know, people have s things to do. And uh, I think one of those seven you know, doesn't really count because they just saw Joshua Bell in concert, so they knew who he was, and like, they sort of sensed that something was up, so that leaves the other six. And, and Oh, yeah, no, that's, yeah, well, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to, that's not supposed to matter, right? It's supposed to be just the music, not, you know, not the, not the, not the flowing robes and the headdress, you know, and the, and the crucifix and the thing that you carry that identifies you as the one who has the, you know, the, the, the bearing the, the spiritual authority. So, um, so of the, I think of the six, hmm? I th he made 40 or 50 bucks, I think. And, and, and of the, it was very, it's a deep story and it'll, it'll take us a, a bit off track, but it, it's kind of interesting because the, the you know, the, the reporter also had stationed around the, the subway the exits, uh, people who would, they were, of course, closely watching all of this on camera, um, partly, you know, to, to, you know, so that the violin wouldn't get stolen and, and all of that. So it was all very you know, carefully, uh, carefully observed. And one of the things they were observing was that for the people who were stopping as they left the, the subway station, someone would, would casually come up to them and say, can we interview you later in the day about the morning commute? You know, it didn't say anything about the violin player. It just said, can we have a chat with you later in the day about the morning commute? So uh, they got their, their information and then called them at the end of the day and said, so, tell us about your morning commute. You know, no leading questions, just to get that extra layer of, okay, of those seven people who had the ear to hear, how many of them, you know, did it really affect? And, you know, and, and several of those then kind of fell away and didn't say anything about it. Uh, and then you were left with those two or three people out of a thousand, you know, who said, oh my God, my morning commute, you know, I heard this incredible music, you know, and, and so forth. So it's down to that, you know, th that sort of ratio, and and I think that's a fair that's a fair ratio also when it comes to, to matters spiritual. You know, there's it's a, it's a small fraction of people who have that openness of mind to be willing to hear truth spoken in unexpected places. I don't know if I have any good quotes on prophet as musician. Let's see what comes up next. Oh, I have examples of divine revelation. So. Uh, this is not divine revelation, of course. This is, I think, a piece of, uh, of, uh, of a Beethoven symphony in, in, in Beethoven's hand. Um, or, or it could be a piece of, of, of a Mozart concerto. I can't, I can't remember which now, I'm sorry. But it's an original composition by one of the great masters, either Beethoven or, or Mozart. Uh, and it, it's meant to, uh, to illustrate the strange similarity in the, in the artistic creative process between, on the one hand, music and divine revelation itself. So this is not in the hand of Baha'u'llah, but this is in the hand of Mirza Allah John Baha'u'llah's amanuensis, who would write down what Baha'u'llah was saying as it was being said, uh, at such speed, at such a revelatory pace that it was difficult for the, for, for the amanuensis to keep, to keep track with the notes. You get a sort of similar sense, you know, with music that there's a sort of, you can almost feel the inspiration, the musical inspiration that's pouring into the, into the mind of the composer as he's struggling to catch up and to, and to, and to capture those notes on the page. And some, some forms of modern art as well uh, demonstrate that kind of frenetic energy, that kind of ca capture, capturing the, the sort of the motion of spirit uh, on, on, on the canvas uh, in a way that, that modern art uniquely does. You know, pr prior to this, the, you know, p painting was all realistic. It was it was representing a particular image, usually a particular scene from a, a sacred text. Uh, in, in in more in the 17th and 18th century, more secular scenes started coming in, um, and then in the 19th century and late 19th century, you started having this.
stream coincidentally by the way very much at the same time as as this divine revelation was happening in the you know in Persia you had this 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 revolution happening in the world of painting you know we were talking late 19th century where suddenly painters are realizing that hold on the point of painting isn't necessarily just to, to put an image on a page it's to convey a spirit and although that spirit can and has been conveyed very deeply through very realistic uh, forms of painting um, as we see throughout history you know the paintings of Michelangelo and, and, and so forth but uh, on, on the on, on the wall of the Sistine Chapel is just, just one example but also um, um, but also there are other ways of conveying that spirit uh, and the energy and the sort of the life force uh, in, in other ways than representational painting and that was and that began with the impressionistic movement in, in the in the later uh, part of the 19th century and it sort of gradually became less and less figurative uh, or, or, and, and more and more uh, impressionistic uh, until you know any uh, until it past post impressionist painting it, you start having just purely uh, uh, purely I ideal images and, and non representational art uh, and Jackson Pollock is w one good example of this um, Mark Toby is another example uh, in, in of a Baha'i artist who is working around this time even just before Jackson Pollock who made very famous the the, the idea of just throwing paint on a canvas in seemingly random patterns, but producing um, resulting images that, uh, for those you know, who have the eyes to see, can be truly electrifying in, in a, 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 and, and be a, a kind of a spiritual encounter for people. Uh, the, there's a few more images here. I think there, there were some more. Uh, maybe one was Mozart and one was Beethoven. This is another page of, uh, of Revelation writing. Um, and, uh, and let's see what's, what comes after that. Stephen, did you want to allow time for questions prior to the lunch break? Should I, are we, run, are we running out of time, aren't we? Uh, we have 15 Gosh. minutes left okay, in okay. this session. Well, you, uh, I certainly can. Let me, t let me maybe find, a, find a, a, a sort of stopping point on this thread, and then we can take some questions. Um, if we go back one, I think I had, I might have had Jackson Pollock. Oh, yeah, okay, it sort of switched. That might be another Pollock. Um, yeah, so you, you get the idea that there's a sort of almost si similarity in things that externally the form seems to have been lost. Externally it seems to be messy or, or formless or scribbling almost. But it's, you know, it's because the encounter of revelation on, you know, with the page has produced this kind of um, uh, an, an energy which almost can be seen in the form, even, even if you don't read the, uh, the, the original language. So... Um, this is, a, this is an example of, uh, of revelation striking the page. Uh, this is in the hand of the Bab, um, and, it's, uh, and it's the first part of the Arabic bayan. Uh, and it's not known whether, uh, whether this is the original revelation writing, because this is a reproduction that I found in a book. Um, and uh, and it's, it's not known whether the Bab had previously revealed it and recopied it in this form, so I can't say for sure, uh, but it strikes me that this may have been the original text because of the nature of, of how it's sort of thrown down on the page. There's 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 a sense of uh, uh, of of flow uh, which is there, and particularly of of how how it sort of reaches the end of the page and then sort of struggles to get in the words and 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 tries to cram in more you know, under, under that heading before going on to the next heading. So it doesn't have the appearance of being a, a pre-planned transcription of an existing text. It has the appearance of being something which was, um, which was spontaneously uh, uh, composed in the moment. Uh, but the, the, these are a few of the, of the opening lines. Almost like a waterfall. This is a, a, a close-up of, um, uh, of the opening lines of the third and the fourth va-head of the, of the Arabic bayan. Uh, and it's interesting what he's saying also. He's saying, um, uh, if, if I could, for, for those, per, if there are any Persian readers, I, and if you can follow along, this is the Arabic language. Bold claims. So Mark, Mark Toby, many of you have heard of Mark Toby as, uh, 
a, a, a Baha'i artist who, uh, who was part of the part of the um, part of the conversation in the art world uh, at the time, and I think his contributions are becoming more um, uh, more appreciated in time. There was just an exhibition given in uh, in Venice just this past year uh, of the art of Mark Toby, uh, and, and a wonderful new book coming uh, has come out. Um, which I recommend if you like this sort of a thing. It's a, it's a gorgeous book, uh, which has a lot, of, uh, a lot of the work of Mark Toby in this sort of vein um, that, that I had never seen before. Uh, he writes about, about the work that he, that he, that he did in, in, in white writing. He says, white lines and movement symbolize light as a unifying idea which flows through the compartmented units of life, bringing a dynamic to men's minds, ever expanding their energies toward a larger relativity. It's a great thought. Um, a Beethoven writing about his own music says, music is the wine which inspires one to new generative processes, and I am Bacchus, who presses out this glorious wine for mankind and makes them spiritually drunken. <laughs> um, John Hatcher has a, a, a lovely little monograph on art and revelation comparing the two, uh, and what he says about, about this is that both the artist and the prophet employ essentially the same techniques. Both refrain from coercing us, but instead employ devices that require us to become artists ourselves. First by investing a sufficient amount of creative thought to comprehend their ideas, and then by reinvesting that understanding with our own creative action. So um, Chogi Effendi talks, uh, talks about art and, and, and its role in, in, in Revelation. Not so much profit as artist, but the fact that every religion has brought with it some form of art. Uh, let us see what wonders this cause is going to bring along. Such a glorious spirit should also give vent to a glorious art. The temple with all its beauty is only the first ray of an early dawn. Even more wondrous things are to be achieved in the future. And I understand it's one of the, the goals of the Desert Rose Baha'i Institute to serve as a, as a nucleus for, for the production uh, of Baha'i art and to, to spread the, some of the inspirations and, and energies of, uh, of the revelation through this, uh, through this medium. So this might be a good stopping point, and I'm going to continue after, the, after, I guess, in the next session uh, to talk about the word of God as opposed to these various metaphors for the manifestation of God. Uh, do we have a, time, a few minutes for questions? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I, I want to shock us back into the current world of reality, if I can. Um, <clears throat> I'm responding to something that you said yesterday about the nature of, ob of observation. And convincing my graduate students who are doing research that the validity, they're, they're all consumed with the validity of their research according to the research council or the journal uh, peer review team or whatever. And getting them to understand the possibility that there's more, <laughs> much more to understanding the world around them than the traditional definition of what makes a piece of social science research valid, which as we all know is provisional. Um, do you have any suggestions for, <laughs> it, you know, it, it, it's such an inconsistency to me to um, listen to a presentation like this and then to have to go back to my students and say to them, well, you know, there are other ways to think about this that are not necessarily going to advance your career right. at this particular time in history, but that really should be part of your thought processes and discourse and so forth. <laughs> uh, any help, please? <laughs> uh, that's, a t that's a tough question. so much easier if you're a physicist. <laughs> you know, things are so much more clear. What The difference between reality, truth and, and falsehood and something that's valid and something that's invalid, there is 
let's say, near unanimous agreement, you know, within the physics community as to what constitutes a valid argument, what constitutes valid research. And as we sort of move from physics to beyond to, you know, biology and then individual human, you know, systems and then collective systems, and you basically get from the simple to the complex, it becomes more and more difficult to sort of know when you have a valid argument, when you've looked at all of the possibilities, when you've accounted for all the variables, because the number of variables explodes. You have enough variables in a physics project to have to control for to be able to say, I have a significant result here. But when you start talking about human systems, particularly collective human systems, you know, the number of variables is now infinite. And any sort of attempt at creating a sort of, I don't know, academic argument that has evidence that validates that argument, you know, it's as though that evidence is the shadow of a higher dimensional figure cast upon the page, you know, because all you've got is this lower dimensional representation of this higher dimensional object. And, yeah, you can talk about the outlines of the shadow maybe. That's equivalent to, you know, to quantitative results in a sociology paper or something. But that's all it is. It's just the shadow of the thing. You know, the whole thing is this three-dimensional thing with all sorts of complexity and colors and smells and texture and so forth. None of that is represented by the shadow, which is all that you're left with when you try to reduce the qualitative dimension of human life to these quantitative forms. But that's part of the, I don't know, the devil's bargain, I think, that many of the humanities have taken in trying to apply the scientific method to human systems. Is that true of research as much as it is of medicine? Well, I mean, metaphorically, a devil's bargain because, you know, something is gained but something is lost. I mean, you know, when these, you know, when the, you know, these departments of the humanities deploy these quantitative methods in an attempt to reach parity, let's say, with the hard sciences, to say, well, we also have our hard, these are our hard results and these, we're also using scientific methods. So we're, you know, it's partly a sort of a, sociologically, you could think of it as sort of, it's a power play to try to get parity with this other method. But it just doesn't, it's not as, it's not as effective or as appropriate a method as applied to these incredibly complex systems, perhaps, as it is in these much far more simple systems that the hard sciences, that the hard sciences use. So it's not, it's not a way forward. It's more, it's more, one has to, one has to, I think, acknowledge the limitations of using quantitative methods in, you know, in fields that, whose subjects are highly non-quantitative. Yes. Yes, this is a question for your translator hat, with your translator hat on. In, particularly gleanings, I guess, so this would be in Shoghi Effendi's translation, the, there's a title of Baha'u'llah, this youth. And I wonder, I'm just wondering if, if that Arabic word that was translated has any different nuance than a word that would be used for a biological age of adolescence. So Baha'u'llah often refers to himself as this youth. I believe the underlying word is Ghulam. And sometimes it's translated also as slave or youth, if I'm not mistaken. If any Persian speaker here would correct me on that. Shaheen in the back. Yeah, it could also be slave. So it's, it's, it's indicating a sort of lowliness, which, which is captured by the idea of youth, you know, because someone of younger age in that culture is someone of lower status. And so the, you know, when Baha'u'llah refers to him as this youth, it's, it's a way of, of, it's, it's, it's through the lens of, of, of the prophet as insignificant, as the most insignificant of all things that, that we saw in that earlier passage in Gleanings, I think. At, at the same time, it has a resonance with the story of Joseph. So Joseph was the youth in the, you know, the youngest of the brothers in, in, in the story, in the, both in the Bible and the, in the Quran, who is basically, you know, abused by, by his brothers and sold into slavery. And it's a whole long story about, about Joseph. Both, both the Bab and, and Baha'u'llah take, take an exceptional interest in the story of Joseph. 
as a metaphor for all sorts of things. Of course, the first revelation or the first book of the Bobs was his commentary on the Surah of Joseph. Baha'u'llah also often refers to himself as Joseph um, because the metaphor of Joseph is someone who is the bearer of something special. Joseph was the interpreter of dreams. He had this amazing ability which was given to him, um, but he was persecuted for it. And so Baha'u'llah often compares himself to, uh, you know, or, or refers to himself as the divine Joseph. And so in that context, perhaps also, when he just says this youth, it, it, it may also be invoking in the, you know, maybe more in the original than, than, than in the translation, the idea of Baha'u'llah as Joseph. This will be our last question. Okay. Well, I'm not sure if this is a question, but I wanted to mention what Jean said, and that is that we've been given the uh, independent investigation of the truth, uh, Dr. Jean Parker. So to me, that's what we're given as Baha'is, the independent investigation of truth, and maybe there will be a new way of doing scientific research. Bringing that into the secular realm well, really is new. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Is there another and better way to do science than, than, than the scientific method that, that, that yes. we've sort of zeroed in on over centuries of trial and error? Uh, I, that remains to be proven. I just want to say one more thing about that. Is I see a lot of students from the university. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a counselor, like a PhD psychologist, but I don't have the PhD. And I just say to them, it's experiential. You have to go out and, and talk to everybody and then gather the information. So I try to teach the Baha'i faith in that way, the independent investigation of truth. I don't know if that's the right thing or not, but yeah. I don't tell them to go to the library and do research. I tell them to go out into the community and talk to people and get yeah. their information. Uh, greetings, friends. Um, we're going to have a few reminders before, but 